So we can just get started and uh, I'll let people in as they join us. So I would like to welcome everyone to MTRI's Summer Seminar Series. My name is Chad Simmons and I'm an ecologist here at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today in Gespoik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. Um, so for anyone who is unaware, uh, the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute is a research-based nonprofit nestled in southwest Nova Scotia near Kejimakujik National Park and Historic Site. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Guestbook as well as beyond. So today, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Rob Johns. He is a forest e insect ecologist from the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, Rob received his uh, Bachelor of Science from St. Uh, Francis Xavier University and his PhD from the University of New Brunswick. And in 2009, following a two-year stint as a postdoctoral research in Northern Japan, Rob uh, joined the Canadian Forest Service in Fredericton. <clears throat> his experience includes insect e ecology and behavior, community science, and integrated pest management, and he has experience working with both native and invasive pests. So next, I'm going to hand the seminar over to him, but I would just like to remind <clears throat> everyone to please keep their mics muted, and if you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the chat window or wait until the end when we'll have a, a question period. So Rob, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Chad. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today <coughs> about some of the spruce budworm research that we've been doing probably over the last eight years or so up in northern New Brunswick. Um, I guess it's covered a lot of New Brunswick, but uh, it's focused a lot of our work in northern New Brunswick. Um, in particular, talking about uh, some of the background of spruce budworm and the so-called early intervention strategy. Um, So for those, I, I think quite a few people that uh, that I saw come on are quite familiar with spruce budworm, but I'll give a really quick introduction to what it is for those that aren't. Um, spruce budworm is a native insect that feeds on spruce and fir trees exclusively, doesn't feed on deciduous trees. Um, you can find it basically throughout the boreal forest. So all the way from here up to the Yukon into Alaska, anywhere where you have spruce and fir, you can find spruce budworm. If you have trees that are being, uh, fed upon or defoliated by spruce budworm, just pictured in the top right there. Uh, you can see, you typically see these, they'll feed on the brand new shoots, basically as they start developing, they'll create some webbing sort of to create themselves a little chamber to protect themselves from natural enemies. And you can see they'll leave their droppings usually stuck in there. That's a little uh, seed like things stuck in there. Uh, and they'll, in many cases, strip the entire new shoots of foliage. Uh, a single budworm can usually eat one or sometimes two shoots worth of foliage uh, in the course of its development. And over the course of, you know, one year of defoliation is not a big deal, but if you have multiple years in a row, let's say up to four or five years of defoliation, you start having trees that look like this as we look up through the canopy. Uh, you can see the tips of the branches, you know, several feet in some cases have been completely defoliated. And this is really characteristic of a spruce butterworm outbreak, this sort of heavy levels of defoliation multiple years. And when you start getting this level of year after year after year defoliation, that's when you're going to start to tree, see tree mortality. Um, so this is a picture taken by one of my old colleagues, Ed Catella, now retired uh, from the Cape Breton Highlands back in the 70s. Uh, 1976, I think, was the peak of the butterworm outbreak. So this would have been around the time uh, taken from one of the planes that we're surveying. And you can see huge, basically, the, an entire forest of basically red uh, fir trees in this case. Uh, as I said, given enough time, you start ending up with white trees, which are basically dead trees, uh, trees that have been defoliated year after year after year. Um, and if we look at the history of spruce butter outbreak, you know, this is not, I mean, one of the things that we know about spruce butter outbreaks, there's a lot of discussion about what causes sort of populations to rise or expand in an area. And one of the things that we've learned, uh, or at least sort of become much more confident in the last dozen years. And you can see here in the 70s, huge outbreak in the, in the uh, East. Um, but one of the things we've learned is that the formation of these hotspots is often caused 
by sort of those initial seeds forming of spruce budworm developing in an area and sort of rising and then basically spreading from there. So it spreads almost, and you can see it in this pretty clearly, it looks spreads almost like a contagion. Um, one of the th other things we know is that uh, spruce budworm outbreaks are not a new phenomenon just of the last century. And this is one of the things that, that many people, um, is one of the questions a lot of people ask. It's one of the debates that uh, we used to have sort of in the early part of the century. Um, we can reach back in the fossil record. Uh, the picture that I'm showing up here is somebody in a peat, in old peat bog. They basically dig these cores, and you can find evidence of spruce bottom droppings or spruce bottom head capsules or wing scales at really high numbers, periodically reaching almost back to the previous ice age. You know, which is about seven, seven eight thousand years. You can detect these periods during which there's spruce butterworm outbreaks. So it's not necessarily just a new phenomenon of spruce butterworm. Um, it'd be sort of what we would characterize maybe as a forest disturbance that could be akin to, let's say, forest fires um, that happens periodically um, and can cover very large areas. Uh, so, you know, fast forward to 2013 is when we in New Brunswick um, started talking about what are we going to do about the spruce butter outbreak. And at this point, Quebec was already probably seven years into theirs, seven or eight years. Um, and you can see they had already expanded uh, on the North shore there. It had started to cross onto the Gaspé Peninsula and it had, it was sort of spreading towards New Brunswick. And we started discussing what we were gonna do. And fast forward to 2020, uh, you can see it basically sitting right along our border there. Um, and this was after, uh, so this is sort of with seven years of this early intervention strategy. So uh, for those of you not familiar with the program, what exactly is early intervention strategy? Uh, it's basically a strategy meant to deal with this expansion of the spruce budworm population or the spread of the spruce budworm population um, into the area or into, into new areas, in this case, New Brunswick. Um, so another way to put it, it's a containment program. And with these new moths or with these moths coming from Quebec and laying eggs in New Brunswick, that creates what we call hot spots or areas where the populations are rising. And our you know, the strategy is basically to suppress those before they become any sort of significant density. So, you know, these are still, we're, we're suppressing at levels where they're not, they're not even causing, you know, massive amounts of damage yet. And I'll just contrast this with what has been done for spruce budworm, you know, during the past 50 or 60 years, where they basically waited for defoliation to get really high. And then they just protect those trees after two or three years, just to keep foliage on the trees of just the high value stands in areas that are probably gonna be harvested sometime soon. And they just leave the outbreak to run its course. And it's worth noting that that's still the strategy that Quebec is using up in the North. Um, ours is basically trying to stop the outbreaks from spreading at all. And so the analogy we often use for this is this sort of game of whack-a-mole that we're playing up in the North with these hotspots. And so the game is we have these hotspots that are starting to rise up in the North of New Brunswick. By controlling those, that's our BTK hammer, um, by controlling those, we are preventing those hotspots, ideally, from, from for forming beyond that containment zone. Um, and that would include Nova Scotia and Maine, ideally, as well. So this sort of neural protection ideally prevents things from moving significantly. So um, I am going to talk a little bit about the insecticides, but first I'd just like to talk sort of big picture on how the program has been working. Like, is, it, is, the, is this actually an effective strategy for managing spruce budworm? Well, one of the ways that we can gauge that is we basically, um, the, the province of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia does this as well, as does Maine and Newfoundland uh, and, and Quebec. Uh, they basically go out in each fall and you can see them on the right there. They're collecting branches. Um, these branches have the overwintering, overwintering stage of spruce butterworm that we call L2. Um, it's just the second larval stage. Um, and they basically collect these branches over a huge area. Uh, and you can see here, these are the, these are the sort of, all those little individual points represents where spruce budworm has been collected. Uh, and so you can see, I think in New Brunswick, there's something along the lines of 1800 to 2000 points taken in a given year. Um, and you can see the ones, the larger spots represent areas that we would characterize as a hot spot. Now, uh, I, I, I can talk about it if somebody has a question about it, but a hot spot basically, if you start having branches with more than six larvae per branch or six L2 per branch, 
Uh, beyond that, those populations are much more likely to rise into an outbreak phase. So we want to keep, that's the threshold at which we want to keep them below. And so basically looking at uh, these sort of hotspots inside and out spurs, let's see how we've been doing. Um, so the first really big year of treatment we had was in 2016. And, and just for the purposes of this, I've removed all the extra spots and just kept the hotspots, uh, the sites that had hotspots uh, on our map here. And so you can see up in Northern New Brunswick, it was sort of concentrated to, to Northwest New Brunswick. You can see Quebec just across the border has basically you know, 80 or 80, 70 to 80% of their, their points are our hotspots. Um, so we had this sort of concentrated area over in the Northeast. And this was caused, we were pretty, it was pretty clear that this was caused by a really big mass dispersal event from Quebec. Um, this is a picture from Campbellton, New Brunswick, which is just on the border there with Quebec um, in a parking lot. And you can see them just carpeting that. And this is a pretty common phenomenon of like these periodic mass dispersal events. But this resulted in a fairly big uptick in the number of hotspots in, uh, in Northern New Brunswick. Um, and so this basically was what shaped the treatment area. You can see here the treatment area is represented in gray, a little bit in Northeast New Brunswick or Northwest New Brunswick and sort of this long sort of trailing trend in enveloping those points in North uh, East New Brunswick as well. And all those little points had little, little sort of patches over top of them. Um, and the two insecticides were that were used in this, I haven't differentiated them here, but it was basically a bacteria uh, that many of you would know as BTK. Um, and the other one is synthetic hormone, uh, also known as tebufenicide. And I will talk about those in a little bit. But basically that's what was used, it was treated onto these areas. And then we went back the next year province went back the next year and looked for hotspots. And you can see it did a pretty good job. You can see in the all the areas, this is the, the, the treatment area from the previous year still represented in gray, but most of the hotspots that they found were outside of this area. They were in marginal areas that were watersheds or areas that couldn't be treated. There was only one sort of area, these, these sort of patches down here where we ended up not seemingly still having hotspots. And part of the reason for this, we, we, it was, we sort of knew early on, was because, because of the weather, it was really late when we actually got to treat those sites. So we ended up with those bouncing back. But that's not a huge problem for the program. What you basically do, we went back the next year, we wrapped those and all the other new hotspots around into another treatment area, which you represented here, applied tebufenicide and uh, BTK, about 50-50 ratios. Um, this was 220,000 hectares in this case, and came back the following year. And so this is starting to look, this, is, this looks much more like it. We had a huge drop in the populations. Uh, you can see north of the border there, Quebec still had tons of spruce bottom up there um, beyond that threshold. And so again, you know, we, we, we seem to have made some progress there. We wrapped that into another treatment area. And so the process continues 2020 we came or 20 the year after that we came back hotspots had shifted in other areas there's a couple more but there's still population densities are really low and i don't obviously don't have the quebec data but there was still tons of spruce but up there i can assure you and so again this got wrapped into it and we've been sort of doing this you know again this year i think we had a slight uptick again this year but i mean we've been working with pretty low densities all across their border especially in contrast with quebec uh, and so you can see why we why we characterize characterize this as this you know game of whack-a-mole because that's essentially what it looks like when you look at it on the map. Um, and one of the interesting thing to note, so this is the uh, six years of treatments that we talked about, uh, or that we talked about. Twenty twenty one is is on there as well. Um, and one of the interesting interesting things you note is when you look at these treatment maps overlaid with each other, you actually don't end up treating most areas repeatedly. There's a few areas, you can see the darkest areas where we had to treat more than once, but for the most part, we have a lot of areas that only ever got treated once, you know, which sort of, again, argues for how narrow this, this sort of control program can end up being. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously, I think the, that visual is pretty compelling evidence for uh, how well the program works. Um, and uh, but like, I mean, let's take another look and just contrast it with actual raw, no like uh, cold numbers from Quebec. So if we look at the percentage of sites that are hotspots in Quebec, um, or that we would characterize as hotspots, um, you know, around 2012, they had sort of around, you know, 75% of their sites 
up in this lower St. Lawrence area, Gaspé Peninsula area, were uh, basically characterized as hotspots. And sort of, you know, a lot of them were well beyond that. We're talking 100, 150 larvae per branch, like crazy high numbers. Um, versus New Brunswick, and you can see basically each year that that continues, has continued to rise up to present and has sort of continued to rise every year since then. And contrast this with New Brunswick, you can see basically we had the slight uptick 2016, you can see maintained in 2017, and then the population has dropped. So we've sort of kept that curve really flat, um, which is exactly where we would want it to be. Um, and just to give some other, you know, just another number to go with it, this is for all of Quebec. Uh, and you can see from 2010 to 2000, uh, 2020, it went from roughly, uh, this is times a thousand, so 1 million hectares of defoliation in 2010, up to almost 14 million um, as of last year. Um, and so you can see this is ratcheted up. And just to put it in contrast, New Brunswick has had about 2,500 hectares of moderate to light defoliation at its peak so far. Um, and I think we'll have a little bit more this year, but it's still really, really low levels, especially when we're comparing it against millions up in Quebec. Um, so I think you know, it makes a pretty strong case for how well this program is working. Um, now, one of the things, so of course, whenever we're talking about efficacy, we also wanna balance that with a talk about the potential sort of concerns around the products being used like tebufenicide and BTK. So I'm gonna give a little bit of time to that as well. Um, and one of the things that we really try to emphasize when we're talking about this program, this type of population control program, is that we don't, you know, a little bit of intervention goes a really, really long way. Um, we don't have to kill a ton of spruce butterwood to have a really effective control of these populations. Now, this little pie chart here basically represents all the different ways that spruce butterwood can die within a year. Uh, there's parasitoids, uh, birds predation, uh, disease, that some of them succumb to toxins in the trees, of course, weather, you know, dehydration or, you know, heavy winds or whatever. There's all these different thing, ways that they can die. And in the course of a given year for a spruce butterworm, you can have somewhere between 95 to 99% mortality. That's sort of the, the nature of their populations. They have really high levels of mortality. But they also don't require very many spruce bottom to survive to be for that population to keep perpetuating. Uh, part of the reason for that is that the females have can lay 180 eggs each. So, you know, with this two to three percent, you know, default, like population that survives each year, you can have populations that are rising into outbreak. But because of that, you know, when we're thinking about trying to control these populations of spruce budworm, we don't want to overlap with the work that these other mortality factors are doing, things like the parasitoids and predators. We want those populations to be extremely vibrant and effective. We want them to have honestly plenty of food. We want them to have enough spruce butter that they, those populations can thrive. And all we really wanna do with our intervention, with our use of these insecticides, is just insert just a tiny bit of extra mortality on top of that, just enough to stabilize those populations. You know, we're not trying to eradicate them, um, we're not trying to overlap with these other these other mortality agents. Just a little bit, you know, two, three. Right? I think our estimate is around. We need about ten percent mortality for these populations to be stabilized. And part of the reason we're able to do that now, we couldn't have done something like this with DDT, which had like ninety nine percent mortality. Obviously, overlapping with a lot of other things aside from the other issues, or phenytrothion, like these old insecticides, would not be useful or not be effective in this type of strategy. Um, the ones we're using, uh, BTK and tebufenicide, or synthetic hormone, are the reason they work is because they are relatively narrow spectrum. Um, they're both registered insecticides with Health Canada. I think these are the only insecticides we have registered in Canada for spruce butterm anymore. Um, they have to be eaten by the caterpillars. So these are not, neither of these are contact insecticides where they land on the skin of the insect or any other creature and have an effect. They actually have to be ingested by the larval stage of the insect. Um, and the reason why they're so what we call narrow spectrum or very specific to caterpillars is because um, they actually require, like they're actually sort of, uh, they work based on the, the unique biology of these, of these caterpillars. So BTK, for example, it can only be broken down in the alkaline stomach of an insect. Like most animals have a very acidic stomach. BTK works in an alkaline environment and insects for whatever reason, ha happen to have a really, really alkaline uh, stomach. 
And that's when BTK can actually work. Um, it tends to break down in really in even modestly acidic environments. Um, the synthetic hormone is based on the hormone that the insect actually has to release periodically as it grows. So like, like a lot of creatures that molt, um, when it's ready and its body gets big enough, it starts releasing these molting hormones. And those hormones basically allow it to start sort of getting ready to start shedding its skin. And when they eat this tebifenicide, it's basically the, just a mimic of that hormone. And it actually causes them to start molting before their body is ready. And they actually get stuck in their skin. Um, and so, or, or it does strange things to the development. Um, and so that's basically how it works to, uh, to, to affect them. Um, I mean, obviously, if our goal is to only have sort of narrow impacts on caterpillars or spruce budworm, we don't want to be affecting all these other creatures. And in this case, neither of these have any direct impact on predators or spruce bottom or parasitoids or any of these things that attack it. Um, they also have no impact on other animals, even, even ones that are unrelated to the spruce bottom program, um, like mammals or birds, or reptiles, any of these sorts of things. They've been tested fairly extensively. I, they do have impacts on other caterpillars that happen to be feeding their, in, in, in those forests that are, that are treated. Um, and we are doing some of our research to try to better understand those dynamics. Um, now, it's also worth, but basically you can jack the BTK up to enormous levels. They haven't found a level yet where it starts impacting these other creatures, um, you know, millions of levels. Um, the the tebifenazide, now, when these are tested, you can, you can eventually elevate tebifenazide up to a level where it starts affecting animals other than spruce budworm but they're really abnormally high levels tested in a laboratory in a closed system, um, which is of course what they do when they're trying to figure out what the limits are of these insecticides. Um, now, one of the most sensitive ones to tebifenicide is this sort this aquatic midge, it's found in water. That's a picture of it here. Um, they're, for, they're relatively common, um, but there was some studies, there, there is some inconsistency in the literature, but, um, but they're, they're, this was one of the most sensitive ones that they found this aquatic midge. Um, no, of course, if we're even when we right from the beginning, people were asking questions about, you know, how much ends up in water and, you know, is this an issue or either of these insecticides an issue. So every year we've been doing water testing for these areas or for any of the areas that are treated streams and watersheds and whatever else. Um, and BTK. So the levels that we found of BTK is 150,000 times lower than the highest level ever tested against animals. And I'll remind you that there's no level at which it actually affects animals. But it's just, it's out there really, really low levels. Um, the tebifenicide, the synthetic hormone, it's found at 6,000 times lower than the, effect, the level affecting that aquatic midge. So that, that sort of sensitive species. So like it, there's extremely little amounts that are ending up in the water. And one of the reasons for that is because you don't actually have to use very much of these to have the impacts you're looking for. Um, it, it's, it's applied at roughly 1.5 liters of the, each of these products per hectare. So if you sort of look at the analogy, that's basically the amount in a coffee cup sort of spread over a hockey rink. So it doesn't take very much to have the impacts that, you know, get that 10% mortality that we're looking for. Um, there, there's also buffers around water, just to, uh, it, as part of the regulations for applying them, you have to have 25 meter setbacks on either side of that water body. So it's 50 meters total um, that are included in there. This is not sort of applied by the pilots. This is basically just plugged into the GPS flight system and it automatically turns the booms on and off to release the, the, the insecticides. Um, and of course, there's also weather restrictions. <clears throat> Anything over 15 kilometer per hour winds is gonna keep those planes down because they don't want a lot of drift and want this to be applied properly. Um, so the technology has become, has become pretty sophisticated in terms of applying these as well. Um, so, yeah, I, see, I mean, so just as a, as a bit of a summary for the talk, I think my, my time looks like my time's right, right about right. Um, th the program does seem to be working extremely well. I mean, and we, you know, I'm a scientist, we'll have the caveat each year, we will evaluate and we will see how we're doing and see if we can make it better. But so far, the results are surprisingly encouraging. Um, and as I said, you know, a little bit of this added mortality coming from these insecticides goes a really long way. I mean, we don't have to do much in large part because the creatures are out there in the ecosystem that naturally keeps these populations constrained is able to 
uh, sort of continue to play its role and which therefore makes much less work for us to do, which is you know, ideal from a cost costing standpoint, um, but is also ideal in terms of just sort of maintaining the, uh, the, the harmony of our ecosystems out there. Uh, and I mean, the big questions remaining are, you know, can we outlast the ongoing outbreak? I mean, we know that a lot of the hotspots we have coming in Northern New Brunswick are coming from, you know, immigrants coming in from Quebec, immigrant moths. Um, and so we're, that's always the battle we have. I mean, in theory, this could end, it, you know, if the Quebec outbreak collapse, which it inevitably will, if we are keeping our populations very low, in theory, our populations could completely collapse as well, and we can end up with without any spruce bottom outbreak at all, any significant one anyways. And so uh, that's what we're going to try to do, and we'll see how that works. Um, and of course, a lot of the research that we're doing right now that I'm a part of is trying to figure out how can we do this better and how can we do it more efficiently? Can we get away with applying one liter per hectare and still hit those efficacy targets or that those you know, mortality targets that we're looking for? Um, and are we in, having impacts on things that we don't want to, especially in particular other caterpillars that are out there feeding on spruce and fir trees? And this is still part of the work that's ongoing. So um, I'll just actually just, uh, this is my team that I work with. Uh, you can see them on the right. That was our last year's uh, social distancing version. Um, I would like to give kudos especially to <clears throat> top left, Dr. Sarah Edwards and Keegan Moore. Uh, they are hired through Forest Protection Limited. Uh, Sarah is a, is a postdoc or one of my, one of a really good collaborator. And they've basically kept this program going in the last two years of COVID because Emily, top right, and Deepa and Veronique and I have not been able as federal employees to do any field work. So they've basically been running the entire program. So I'd like to give them fair acknowledgement for uh, their heroic efforts to do this work. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. That's great. Thank you, Rob, for that really interesting and well-rounded talk. So um, yeah, as Rob said, we can open things up for questions and I'm sure it's going to be a lively uh, question period. I have a question for you, Rob. Yes. Um, so I'm sorry, I missed the first couple of minutes of the, the webinar and I may have missed this at the beginning, but spruce bedroom, does it not attack actually more fir trees than spruce trees or is that? It, it'll, it will attack spruce tree, like white spruce and balsam fir trees in relatively equal numbers. Some people, there's some people debate that it's more likely to attack balsam fir trees but um, it's pretty close. Um, black spruce or red spruce that you guys have a lot of in Nova Scotia is less susceptible to it. Um, it's not as good of a host, but um, one of my key, uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Deepa Pirasaran does a lot of work in Northern New Brunswick. And when the outbreak gets high enough, it doesn't make any difference for spruce butter. You know, if they get high enough, they're gonna defoliate all the types of trees that are available out there. Certainly low densities, like white spruce and balsam fir, you can we have lots of stands with low densities that are both getting hit. Awesome, thank you. I have a question if I should ask. Yes, oh, sorry, did, did, uh, was that Bill? Bill Ernst? Bill, do you want to go ahead and ask your question again? Uh, we didn't I didn't hear anything there if other people did. Okay. I think your mute button is on, Bill. You sure you got it now? Do I have it on? Yeah, okay. we can hear you. You're good now. Yeah. Um, yeah, excellent talk. Um, <laughs> background, I was involved in some of the early environmental monitoring work with the spruce bedroom spray pro programs in uh, New Brunswick. So I, I'm just curious, I was tuning in to find out how things have changed. Um, but uh, just the curiosity, you didn't mention the Quebec uh, control programs. Um, 
as I recall, the moth dispersion uh, incidents, uh, they can be several hundred kilometers uh, under the right conditions. And I'm sure Quebec is just the refugia for uh, those moth dispersion uh, uh, events. Um, is there any coordinated effort to, to um, try to uh, get Quebec to uh, control in those areas that might uh, affect dispersion to New Brunswick? They, they're not. They're not running their program. Uh, as, as I said, they're doing foliage protection, which which you'd be familiar with, Bill. I'm sure. Um, they're not doing. They're they're not necessarily coordinating it with the thought that they can suppress these sources or refugia budworm from coming in. But their program is, uh, I think, so normally it's around half a million hectares that they would treat. Some of that singular double application um, in the lower St. Lawrence area. And that can that covers quite a few of like the, the, the most intense areas, not all of them, but it does actually, we think it actually does have a pretty impact, a big impact in terms of reducing them from coming to us. Now, during the last year, because of COVID, they actually didn't treat at all. So that half a million hectares that normally would have been treated didn't get treated at all. Um, and we had a, a noticeable spike in northern New Brunswick. Like we're not back to any levels like we were, but there was a noticeable spike up in particular one little patch um, that we think might have been at least augmented by that. So now it should be said that they are completely coordinating their spray program because they basically collaborate with Forest Protection Limited uh, in their equivalent of SOPFIM. Um, and so those guys work together basically to deploy the treatment program across both of our provinces here and there, and also Newfoundland as well, that they help with as well. Um, but in terms of, are they treating potential sources with the intention of protecting New Brunswick? No, no, but we do get some of that benefit, I think, from their treatment program. Okay, I'm sure there's other questions. If there is, sure. I'll, I'll come back. Sure. Um, there are some questions in the chat window. So Leah asks, are certain tree species at risk of disappearing in Quebec because of these hotspots? Uh, no, I don't think, no, I, that, that's certainly not a risk. I mean, not all of the trees are, are going to be killed. It's not like emerald ash borer or, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid I was talking with Jane about before, where it's like 99% mortality of those, those host trees. Um, spruce is very, what spruce and balsam fir are both very well adapted to spruce bugworm. Um, and you have a large number of them that that uh, are that survive in the course even after they lose growth. You will have a fair amount of tree mortality. But I think even uh, now, you know, high. It, it sort of depends on where it was. If I recall, during the previous spruce bottom outbreak in the Cape Breton Highlands, tree mortality of balsam fir was somewhere in the range of 90 90 ish percent. And so there's a huge impact. But I think the average across its range of an outbreak is closer to 20-ish percent, you know, if you average across everywhere. So that's certainly not enough to, what you know, wipe out spruce or fir. That's a good question, though. I'd like to ask a question. Um, I mean, I, I sort of know the answer, but I think it's always worth stepping back and asking, so why do we do this? What, what if we did nothing? Uh, how, how much difference? Would it, who's, who benefits from this program? Uh, well, that's the, it, it, there can be benefits in different ways. You know, of course, there's the economic benefits. Uh, New Brunswick, in particular, is quite reliant on spruce and fir um, for both their lumber and for um, for the lumber mills, but also for pulp and paper to some extent. Um, and so, a lot of the New Brunswick economy, especially, is built on that. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, 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 it's pretty substantial loss, uh, potential loss, in that sense. Now, one of the things we still we also talk about, though, is that you know there are um, unintended impacts of a spruce butter outbreak potentially on ecosystems, especially one that's sort of you know out of control and over very large areas. Um, we've talked about it in terms of impacts on potential carbon budgets um, of of sort of removing the foliage, which is the organ of keeping uh, of sort of carbon sequestration by these trees. Um, there's, I mean, when a spruce butterm outbreak is extremely, extremely high in an area, the other things that feed on spruce and fir, the other caterpillars, are going to be outcompeted by them, especially those that feed a little bit later in the season. Um, if you have trees that are getting 100% plus defoliation, it doesn't leave a lot of food for these other things. Um, so there, 
you know, there is also impacts on parks that rely on tourism and don't like having huge swaths of red trees um, as, you know, as for people that are coming to those parks. Um, so, I mean, the, the forest industry has a big push behind these things, but there are other sort of side impacts of a spruce bottom outbreak. But fundamentally, this is economic. In other words, from the ecological perspective, if forest fires were allowed to burn and if uh, um, you know, budworms were allowed to boom and crash, would not the forest primeval be more or less as it was before, uh, towards whatever, whenever it got started at the end of the last ice age? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that would be the case or not. I mean, these successional processes take extremely long time. So, I mean, I guess if there was no sort of harvesting and no spruce butterworm outbreaks or, or this you know, spruce butterworm was allowed to run its course uh, for the next couple hundred years, I mean, I, I, I don't know what this, what the equilibrium is that it would bring it back to, right? I mean, is that like predominantly the large, the large numbers of pine that used to exist across the area? Is it a more sort of balanced deciduous? I mean, ecosystems would find a balance, but I'm, I'm not sure what or how you could, how, or how I would predict what trajectory the forest would go with this. But I mean, yeah, you're right in the sense that a lot of this is driving, driven by economics in the sense that, you know, our, the economy of New Brunswick at least is based on balsam fir and spruce trees. So losing those is a significant economic impact. So can I ask another one? Sure. Um, yeah, it, it's along the line of that questioning. Basically, um, when I left off, um, the strategy seemed to be that uh, it was foliage protection that was the objective. But the downside of, of that is that as, when you're preserving the foliage, you're making it more susceptible to spruce budworm. And the, in actual fact, this is a positive feedback uh, mechanism that uh, really the more susceptible foliage you get, the more likely you are to get a severe outbreak. Um, is, is that a concern in this kind of program? I mean, that was the biggest, that's the, that was the big issue with mountain pine beetle, right? They preserved huge areas of pine over huge swaths of areas and prevented and suppressed forest fire. Um, and so you ended up with like absolutely enormous mountain pine beetle outbreak that decimated most of it. Uh, it is a question, like even as an ecologist, which is what I am, it's not obvious to me. Uh, I, I don't like, I, I guess I, what I mean is I don't know if we end up with forests, if we suppress this butterworm outbreak, if we end up with forests in 10 years time that just sort of continue to be uh, at the risk of a spruce butterworm outbreak, or if there is a true like strong period of these outbreaks, you know, where it sort of hits on those intervals of roughly 30 years or so. And because, um, I mean, we've had a lot of balsam fir and a lot of spruce in New Brunswick, especially since the, the last outbreak collapsed in 1990. I mean, there's been lots of lots of balsam fir during this entire period with no suppression. Um, so I, I don't think it's quite, it's just that if we suppress this, we're going to end up with a large amount or with just sort of continuous spruce butterworm outbreaks. But certainly, if we maintain a forest that is predominantly balsam fir and spruce, we're always going to be at a big risk of spruce butterworm outbreaks and the impacts of those spruce butterworm outbreaks. And therefore, there's always going to be pressure to manage them. Yeah, well, in the <clears throat> certainly the 70s and the 80s, uh, back in the large area spraying times, um, it, it did seem to be that the more uh, area you preserved uh, one year, the larger they came back the next year. So, anyway. I, yeah, I, I, I though I, I part of I mean my hypothesis around some of that is when you use insecticides that also you know significantly impact the natural enemy community. Um, in various ways, you're sort of creating these enemy-free spaces for which spruce butterworm can bounce back. Now, I don't have data for that, but I mean, that's certainly, uh, 
Well, I, I can say this much. I, I know this much just looking back at the old literature on uh, DDT because we have a lot of like the base stuff in the 1950s when they first started collecting data and they would report levels of efficacy for DDT of like 99% in a forest, like which of spruce bottom, which is crazy, like crazy high level. And within three years, it would be completely re-inundated because you have all this dispersal back into that area uh, from all the surrounding forests that they weren't managing. And the only difference was is that you would remove probably most of the natural enemies in there. They were helping to keep those populations low. Mm -hmm. um, so just moving on to another question. Um, you've talked about this a lot, Rob. Um, but what are some of the impacts, or are there any other known impacts on other insect species, such as butterflies and moths? So yeah, both the insecticides will impact um, other caterpillars that happen to be feeding at the same time as spruce budworm. Um, it has to be a pretty tight, like pretty tight synchrony in the feeding cycle with spruce budworm because with B, in the case of BTK, because BTK is really only out there like eight to ten days, and it's sort of basically UV light gets rid of it. Tubby fenicide can last longer, can last a couple months, I think, at least. Um, but the, the impacts, at least that we've seen so far, this is, this is pretty consistent with the literature. It's not a massive amount of mortality in these other, in these other insects. Now, they're all, most of them are persist at really low levels, but we can almost always find them from year to year in most of these areas, um, the, the more common species. It's a lot harder for us, and one of the things that we think about a lot, it's, it's a lot harder to assess ones that are just naturally rare. You might find them once every four years or so on, you know, in your stands. If they disappear the next year, does that mean that BTK or tebifenicide had an impact or, or is it just sort of part of their natural rarity? Um, one of the things that, that it's, it's probably less of an impact on most butterflies, just because it tends to be on spruce and fir trees. It's not, you're not just treating like open fields and stuff or uh, areas where butterflies would probably be more abundant. Um, but, but certainly we don't think uh, that there is a very large impact in the stands that we're working in. Um, and I'll, I'll just actually just add to that. There has been some work done for other programs using at least DTK. Um, that's like the gypsy moth programs, for example. And in most cases uh, where you actually have sort of replication in those phases, like where they have multiple sites to sort of look at, they haven't found really strong or lasting impacts of things like BTK on the non-gypsy moth populations for what that's worth. Could I ask another question? Sure. Um, here in Southwestern Nova Scotia, we have the uh, the Acadian forest, which is quite different from the boreal forest that is uh, predominantly conifer, uh, it's quite mixed. Um, I guess when it was when it when it was old, it was it was uh, oak and, and pine, but uh, there's plenty of spruces and uh, balsam fir and stuff like that. But it seems to me the the threat, whether it's economic, ecologic, or or you know massive outbreak versus versus slow burn, must be quite different in uh, the Acadian forest where MTRI is, is located compared to say Northern New Brunswick, which is, as I understand it, fundamentally Southern Boreal Forest. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, so more of a mixed forest, there's quite a bit of evidence and that evidence seems to be increasing with, with some of the research that my colleagues are doing. There's really good evidence that if you have a more mixed, like a mix with deciduous hardwood and softwood type of forest, the overall intensity of a spruce bottom outbreak is gonna be lower. Um, part of it they think is because they, it just supports a much more vibrant natural enemy community. And I've talked a lot about how important natural enemies are for control. It has a much more vibrant natural enemy community that um, is able to keep spruce bottom in check under those circumstances. And we have quite a few different types of like experimental and survey type data that seem to, to buttress that. Um, and I think even during the previous outbreak, you know, most of that area where you guys are did not get super hard hit by a spruce bottom, I don't think. Seems like this could have implications for tree planting programs, which are almost always exclusively let's let's get the let's get the spruce trees going growing fast. A uh, you know, mixed a mixed stand might actually be far more resilient and sustainable. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly it, it is it is 
probably more expensive to harvest if you only want balsam fir and spruce. Um, but I, it is probably much more much much more resistant to a spruce buttermilk outbreak. So what you might end up with, um, at least according to what I've read, what you might end up with is shorter duration outbreaks and lower intensity. I'll ask another one if there's dead air. Sure. sure. Um, so you mentioned that there's only two registered uh, products now. Mm -hmm. um, does that worry you? Um, for example, uh, is there any evidence that um, resistance is being produced uh, by uh, use of these? And uh, is there a need to uh, move on to other chemical insecticide? Well, as I, I mean, unless there is an equivalently narrow spectrum chemical insecticide, which I don't know of, then it, it would never be an option for the type of program that we're running for early intervention strategy, um, just because those tend to overlap, uh, I suspect, too much into the other mortality factors. Um, BTK and tibifenazide are, to a lesser extent, are used quite extensively in agriculture. Um, they're used in some cases, multiple three, four times a year against a variety of pests. I have not seen any strong evidence for resistance. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because of the nature of the biological interaction that makes it more difficult to become well adapted to quickly. Um, in those cases where you're having multiple applications per year and over long sort of stretches of time, they have not shown evidence of resistance. Um, in our case, uh, as I showed in one of the maps, we don't end up with sort of treating areas multiple times year after year after year. Um, but it is something, it's a really good point because it is something we're conscious of. And it's part of the reason why we've made such an effort to have both of the tabufenicide and the BTK in use and available and sort of being tested. Because if there does start to become evidence, not just in our system, but in like agriculture systems where evidence of examples of resistance that start to crop up, it's something we're going to start want to start thinking about in terms of sites being treated, for example, year after year. Do we end up sort of shifting between the two insecticides? Do we sort of, and how do we change our strategy? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's on our radar. But I mean, honestly, right now, I don't know of any other alternative insecticides that could be used for it. Um, unless there's something being developed I don't know about. Yeah, I, I don't either, but um, I, just to, aside, I think maybe one of the reasons that uh, you're not seeing uh, much development of resistance is that uh, they're actually weak kill factors on both of those products. And mm. um, it actually preserves genetic diversity a little better. Um, that I, I think literature shows that you get more resistance occurring when you get higher kill factors. Um, oh, that's, a, that's a good point. I actually didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually, a, that is a good point because it's not exactly a hard bottleneck, right, for of natural selection on the populations. But that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Mm -hmm. um, in the chat window, Andrea asks, actually, she just wants to confirm that uh, these insecticides are not dangerous to humans. No, there's uh, no impact of them uh, on humans, either sort of the accumulation, which is one of the issues with the old insecticides, or just acute sort of exposure or anything. There's no issues at all. And um, Susan asks, um, has thinning helped in the Acadian forest to help deal with hmm. spruce budworm? I think that's Susan's question. I mean, uh, yeah, th thinning, thinning is sort of an interesting one because, uh, and I, I've heard different explanations for whether it's good or whether it's bad. Um, one of the arguments that it's good is that the trees can grow much more quickly and therefore small, even the, the amounts of defoliation that they would take from spruce budworm can be compensated for very quickly because they can put out new foliage because they're not also under the stress of competing with other trees. Um, 
I've heard another vein of argument that what that does by having these open trees makes these trees much more um, nutritious, like that new foliage more nutritious because it's in the sun. And that means you have a larger spruce butterfly population that can cause more damage to it. Um, I haven't seen good evidence in terms of like experiments or even survey data arguing one way or the other. Um, so it's not obvious to me which, which of those uh, is beneficial. Does anyone else have any final questions? Jane? I have a question, Rob. Um, thanks so much. That was a great, great talk. Learned a lot again. Um, just regarding when you have a hotspot outbreak, um, how do you decide what area to treat? Um, you know, if it, do, is it a standard area or does it depend on if there are sort of um, adjacent hotspots? And also, I, I guess it references a question that came up earlier is if there was um, something like a species at risk or a rare, a rare insect species or butterfly species, a bird species in that area, would that be factored into the equation before treatment? Is there a mechanism there? So the, they're basic, so the way that basically the, they create those swaths of area that are treated, um, my, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dave McLean and Dr. Chris Henniger, who is with the province, Dave McLean's with um, UMB, University of New Brunswick. Um, they have an algorithm they basically do. Uh, the numbers, the density goes into it, into this algorithm. Um, and, but also the percentage of softwood that is in that forest, like of spruce and fir. So if you have like some a forest that is, I think it's 90, 80 or 90% hardwood that that area is going to get cut out automatically and so what this algorithm they have does is it prioritizes areas with very high densities of balsam fir and very high densities of spruce budworm and essentially it's a gps exercise where basically a creaking exercise where it basically pulls in and shapes these areas based on forest composition and the number of hot spots and so the way that it sorts itself out if you have something that's very distant away um but has, you know, high budworm, that's where it ends up getting its own sort of like little postage stamp of treatment area. If it's close enough, those, those tend to sort of wrap themselves together um, into a sort of a single continuous block. Um, already, we end up cutting portions of those, even though under, after that, that sort of baseline is done, they cut out portions of areas that, for example, are watersheds um, with, you know, larger sort of bodies of water, those get cut out. If there's a cottage or any sort of residential areas in there, um, those are gonna get automatically sort of blocked out with, I don't remember the size of the buffer, but I think it's a kilometer or two um, around. So, so you have these patches that are cut out for that. You have some areas that have no spruce bottom around them, but have a really high balsam fir content, but they're near these sites that end up sort of pulling, that they get pulled into these spray blocks. And so I think there's a little bit of trimming of that sort. So we're not just treating areas just because they have high balsam fir content, but not necessarily budworm. Um, we've never had to deal with cutting out for um, like an endangered species or anything like that yet, though mostly just because we don't have clear data that there are impacts of that sort yet. But it certainly would, yeah, I mean, it could be done quite easily in the, in the course of the program because we block out all sorts of things for all sorts of reasons um, after getting that initial sort of base layer of uh, treatment. Thank you. Um, Susan just asked um, about spruce budworm and its relationship with climate change. And she said she's seen budworm on stressed trees, overstocked thin soils, et cetera. Uh, does forest vigor affect bug worm? Uh, in the sense of like site quality? I assume so. I, I assume so. I, yeah, I mean, the climate, the climate change issue is a really sort of uncertain one right now. Um, certainly, uh, my, my colleague uh, Deepa has shown that the populations have pushed much farther north than we've see, ever seen them before, at least within the last century or so. Um, further north into northern, northern Quebec onto stands that are typically have not been hit in the past or at least weren't hit during the previous couple of outbreaks. Um, 
site quality does have an impact on these, uh, you know, how well spruce budworm does, but it's not, it's not clear to me if it's just super stress sites because super stress sites, the trees can sometimes be of a lower nutritional quality. And so it's not necessarily a good host for spruce budworm um, versus trees that are growing very vigorously might also have also very good defenses. And so it can be a bit of a mixed bag of what's, what's sort of a good stand and what's not. That's hard to sort of characterize just based on sort of tree stress and these types of things, because there's probably a sweet spot in there where uh, they do best. But it's worth noting that like, those are sort of the luxuries of spruce, the decision of spruce budworm could make at lower densities. When they get high densities, they eat everything. Stress, non-stress, though. If they get high enough, they'll, they'll, they uh, will not discriminate. And, and many of them will starve. Just the same. Okay. Well, with that, I think we've answered all the questions. And I'd like to thank Rob again for joining us tonight, as well as the Region of Queens for supporting our seminars. Um, and everyone here can join us again next week on Thursday, July 15th at 4 p.m. when Nick uh, Knutson from MTRI will be talking about uh, the MTRI-led Nova Scotia Herpetology Atlas project that is working to track and monitor amphibians and reptile species in the province. And if anyone missed anything tonight or would like to rewatch the seminar again, please stay tuned to our YouTube channel where uh, we upload all of our seminars. So thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you are all well and we get to see you all again very soon.